and get started with the talk. Okay. All right, so welcome everyone to Cardiology Grand Rounds. Today we have Dr. Bruce Conklin, who will be giving us a lecture on decoding and repairing motor neuron disease for CRISPR and IPS cells. Uh, Dr. Conklin is a senior investigator at the Gladstone Institute, as well as a professor in the departments of medicine, cellular and molecular pharmacology, and ophthalmology at UCSF. He is also the deputy director of the Innovative Genomics Institute. He completed his medical school at Western Reserve University and spent two years in the lab of Nobel laureate Julius Axelrod at the NIH. He completed his internal medicine residency training at Johns Hopkins um, and his postdoctoral training in molecular pharmacology here at UCSF with Dr. Henry Bourne. Dr. Conklin's lab focuses on curing genetic diseases using state-of-the-art genome engineering technology um, using patient-specific induced pluripotent stem cells to model CRISPR therapies for diseases including sudden cardiac death and cardiomyopathies. He has received a number of awards and honors over the years and has been continuously NIH funded since 1999 with over 150 publications. So thank you, Dr. Conklin, for joining us virtually. <clears throat> if anyone has any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat or you can raise your hand and we can ask them in person as well. That's great. Yeah, that's, that's great. Yeah, feel free to ask any questions you want. And uh, it's a pleasure to talk to the, uh, the cardiology community. I've over the years had uh, terrific interactions with the division. Um, I'm going to just start with uh, some of... Huh, I'm not getting a forward. There we go. Uh, the just to start with, just an image of the of the lab, and then the the, the folks that are inv uh, involved. Uh, the, in terms of you, uh, and and uh, you know, we'll we'll try to name them as as we go forward with this. Um, yeah, just to start with uh, my my complex, I am a founder of Tanaya uh, Therapeutics, which focuses on heart failure. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, a project which is related to that. Uh, and then uh, the scientist.com, which is just an advisory board. And then uh, these nonprofits, which is really where I spend uh, most of my time. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about the Allen Institute. So these are the four takeaway messages, and I will uh, and I will show this uh, as we go forward. Uh, I'll start off with what is CRISPR, and then talk about how stem cells work with it, uh, and then a, a brief vignette about uh, you know concerns about th at, at the issues of a of potential germline editing, and then uh, end with some promises uh, that are that are promising things to keep an eye on as we go forward. So first, uh, CRISPR is a, a programmable DNA uh, scissors. Uh, it's derived from bacteria. Uh, it, bacteria use it as an antiviral, uh, but uh, we use it uh, really for, uh, for, for um, making uh, edits to the genome. And it's uh, really basically, we, you know, what's so cool about it? Well, it's a hundred times faster and easier and cheaper than DNA editing technologies that came for it. So just imagine that anything you do uh, is a hundred times faster. That, that's that's going to be significant. So just there's a movie here where I try I try to actually talk a little bit about uh, you know going into the cell what what would CRISPR do I'll try to stop this at key places so if this is a DNA here there's certain sequences and you'll see this uh, this is actually what we call a PAM site this is actually a GG uh, in the genome that obviously occurs a lot of different places but this the CRISPR is going to look for that GG grab onto that and then open up the DNA. Uh, and uh, and then cut it. Uh, so it's looking around, it's surveying, it sees that GG, 
It opens uh, the DNA up uh, and then inserts a, uh, what is inserting here is an RNA probe that it, that it uses that is specific for this particular stretch of DNA. So what it is, is that the RNA is like the delivery system. It's the, the address, as it were, it's the barcode uh, that's saying you want to go to this part of the genome and not another part. The, the, that's encoded here. And you can see that the RNA is actually inter, uh, uh, really interdigitating with the DNA. And then once it actually sees that it actually has made the complete uh, recognition, then it cuts and it cuts in two places uh, in here and causes a complete break. Um, and this is um, this is actually what the bacteria want to do to the viruses uh, to get rid of them. Uh, but it's also now we're trying to figure out how to make this machine work for us. Uh, and then now we're going to see this over again because we're going to do two cuts here around a disease area, as indicated here. And then we're going to try to cut that out. So if we make a cut here and make a cut here, uh, one way to escape the, the 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 grasp of this of this CRISPR is the repair enzymes that are trying to look for that. And one way to if they can loop out this uh, piece, then they make something which the guide RNA no longer sees, and so that everything starts over again. This uh, this was uh, recently the uh, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry was uh, was uh, was awarded to Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna. Uh, as uh, shown here, uh, two uh, really terrific uh, female scientists and, and also uh, quite uh, deserving of this really breakthrough uh, scientific discovery. Uh, this this uh, this actually has had a lot more publicity uh, than others, and some people often people ask me like, what do I need to read about this? And so uh, <clears throat> there's actually a terrific book by uh, Walter Isaacson, uh, who's a terrific writer, uh, and this is actually probably the best sort of has the details of what went on. Crack and Creation is a book that Jennifer actually wrote with one of her uh, graduate students and was, uh, it really provides kind of like what, a sort of a basic discussion of like just what DNA is and things like that. It's sort of made for like a college uh, class in molecular biology. But the one that I recommend the most is this movie called Human Nature. This is actually on Netflix, and you can, it actually gives a very, very accurate uh, view of a, a discussion and with, with, with scientists who were involved in it, and, and as well as sort of how the whole thing works. And I, I, I think that this is, this is the easiest uh, uh, watch. It's about, a, I think it's an hour and a half, uh, and uh, is really beautifully, beautifully done, produced partially here in San Francisco, and then also, uh, but also all around the world. Um, so then the, quite, the next thing that, you know, the, this discussion is about is how does CRISPR work with stem cells? And so I have to give a little bit of a background of, of why uh, these two revolutionary technologies uh, sort of work together. And just to t talk a little bit about what iPS cells are uh, and stem cells. And so I take you back way back uh, now uh, to uh, uh, 2005. Uh, and actually, at that time, people actually talked about stem cells and cloning people and things like that. And, and what, what we really were talking about was take the nucleus out of a cell from a patient and pop it into an egg and then have the uh, and have the uh, essentially the egg be tricked into being a uh, into a, what they call a blastocyst. And those blastocysts, these cells here, are the cells that can be used for a stem cell. And this was actually the concern and the, the ban from the, uh, for, uh, for, for human cloning and, and things like that were coming from this technology. And this was called somatic cell nuclear transfer. Um, and that was the, that a lot of people thought that that was going to uh, be the way that we would make stem cells from humans. But the pro, and in fact, it's a great way to make stem cells uh, from, say, pigs and cows and, and all sorts of other animals. But in primates, what the problem is, is that this just doesn't work in primates, and we are primate, and uh, we just, it doesn't work very well. And so this, actually, this technology, although was the, the leading one uh, back in 2005, uh, really, uh, there, were, there was a controversy about a lot of, uh, there was actually even some, uh, uh, the Korean stem cell scandal that you might have re remembered with people faking that this worked, uh, but in fact, it doesn't. And in fact, what happened was 
that you could now make the stem cells directly. The, what, the reason that it's, you don't hear about uh, nuclear transfer very much anymore is that you can actually make iPS cells by putting four factors, genes in transiently into any cells, into fibroblasts, and they could make uh, they could make identical stem cells. And that's what we do all the time. And the important thing is, there's a couple of important things. It's easier, it's faster, it's more robust. Uh, but the, the other thing that's important about it is that there's no eggs that are needed, right? So you can actually, now the whole controversy is, is blown away and we can make these now thousands and thousands of iPS cells are being made. Uh, no eggs are involved. Uh, but yet we're making cells which are really uh, essentially identical to uh, the embryonic stem cells that were being made before. So uh, just to, to illustrate what we think is going on with iPS cells, we, we think about uh, development as, uh, you know, as essentially uh, balls rolling down a hill. When we start off as, a, as an embryo, we think about essentially they, that these uh, cells are, could be anything. They roll down the hill and they come to the bottom and they can just do anything at that point. Be, you, know, the, any, you could roll down this way and make blood vessels. You could go this way and make heart cells, but it doesn't go backwards, right? It just goes forward. That's the, the dogma in, in uh, development was that this all rolls down the hill and then stays there. Um, but what Shinya did, which was really important here, is that he could he he showed that, oh no, we got back, I'm gonna have to go back here. Um, so what he showed was that the balls can roll down the hill, like these are individual cells here. And then now if you put just four factors into say these fibroblasts, these cells then will roll back up the hill and become just like the embryonic stem cells. And these cells are the ones that now we can grow indefinitely, and then we can make any cell type we want. And, and that is the key in terms of for medical research is to make any cell we want, because we want we have, we have to deal with disease and lots of different types of cells. And really, actually, very, you know, some people care about the embryonic stem cell state for sure. Uh, but, uh, you know, for, cardi for, for cardiac disease, yeah, actually, it's so great because cardiac cells uh, are, will grow from this and we really couldn't have cardiac cells before. So for this, uh, the Nobel Prize was won by John Gurdon, who had actually done the first cloning with frogs and the somatic cell uh, transfer that I talked about earlier. And then uh, Shinya Yamanaka, who, uh, his, who really, that, the beauty of this technology is that anybody could use it. Uh, it's so simple. It's, a, it's a really a high school science project uh, at this point. And so why use these uh, iPS cells? You can make all sorts of different kinds of neurons, all kinds of muscle, all of these cells that really you couldn't uh, do before. And we've been mostly active in here, but actually all of these other cell types have been made essentially from iPS cells. And I can tell you some of them are harder, some of them are less hard. Uh, and so there's you know different, lots of different degrees of ability to make things like islet cells and hematopoietic cells. But one of the most easy cell to make is cardiac myocytes. And so that's actually for, for this particular group that that's, that's important. Neurons are probably the easiest to make. Cardiac myocytes are, 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 are uh, probably the, the next easiest. And then, um, th then there's, there's lots of them that fall as much, much more difficult to make, but can be done. So just to illustrate sort of what, how this system can work together, uh, you can actually take some cardiac myocytes that now been engineered with CRISPR and uh, to look at a specific molecule, in this case, alpha tubulin. And this was done by the Allen Institute. So that we gave cells to the Allen Institute, they engineered them uh, and they're providing us uh, these uh, movies. Uh, these cells are available for public distribution so anybody can have them. So these are iPS cells, but obviously they've been turned into cardiac myocytes. And you can see the, sh the movement of the cardiac myocytes are actually very well marked by this uh, the microtubule marking. So the microtubules are all fluorescent in this particular case. And we're looking at them in live, uh, live cells uh, in, in video. And that's one of the great things about this now is now if you actually edit, now they've they put GFP in 50 or 60 other places, uh, other genes, but here I just wanna show you for the, for the cardiac uh, world. Now you take the Z disks and if the Z disks are marked, uh, it actually has a very different motion uh, than uh, the microtubules because the Z disks here are actually, you can actually measure the distance between the Z disks as they come together, but it's a very different motion than those long filaments uh, that we we're seeing before. 
And so this, this kind of uh, technology is not only important because we can make it and someone can see it, but actually these cells now, because they're made put into public repositories, are being distributed all over the world. So well over a, a, a thousand orders of these of cells uh, like this, the, these genes and other genes have been distributed. Uh, and uh, it gives me great pleasure to actually think about how uh, these are working to help other people in, in terms of uh, their studies. So how does CRISPR work in stem cells? And so I just want to tell you a little vignette about a current project that we recently published, uh, just to give you kind of a vignette about how this potentially could work and I'd be happy to sort of brainstorm with you also about how it could work for other genes as well, but there's lots of genes that, that this could work with. So really the focus of my lab has actually been these two disruptive technologies. Uh, both the iPS cells and CRISPR, how they could work together and how we can actually leverage this overlap essentially, because essentially the people who work with iPS cells, they don't necessarily know about CRISPR and certainly the CRISPR folks, uh, the last thing they wanna do is work with iPS cells because they're way too uh, difficult to work with compared to say cancer cell lines. And so what we do is work with people who are working with cancer cell lines and then transfer that over to medically relevant tissue uh, such as that. And so there's, it's in that space is really where we have the, the, the biggest leverage. And so I'm gonna tell you two stories, one about decoding uh, in a, uh, using a CRISPR to decode a, a, a SNP uh, actually for cardiovascular uh, uh, potentially a cardiovascular protective allele and then uh, repairing. And so I'm gonna start off with decoding. And so how do we use this to identify disease, particularly how about subtle changes in disease, okay? So you're all familiar with doing clinical trials. Uh, one of the big problems about clinical trials is that you really don't know how the controls and the, and the, and the treated ones, you know, what they were gonna do anyway, you know, what is their real, you know, predisposition to this particular disease? And you try to balance these two out, but I chose the, these, you know, mix them a little bit so that it's obvious that these two are different and, and you can only treat the treat, treatment group. And is it really different because of that? And you just have to cre create the N, uh, the number of patients by quite a lot. But what if you could just have clones for patients instead. So all the patients were genetically identical. I know that that doesn't happen, but just imagine that that were the case. And you've got everybody here is all the same. There's, there's six identical twins here. And now we actually now mutate a, 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 a specific change, like a drug uh, treatment in, in this case, or let's say the, the thing that I'm going to do is actually gonna say, okay, let's just make a single base pair change, a single change in their, the entire genome and see how these guys are different than those guys, okay? How would that actually be possible? Obviously it couldn't be possible in where all the patients are different, different genetic backgrounds, but maybe if we have an isogenic control, in other words, they're genetically identical, that would be uh, possible. Obviously you can't do this in people, but you can do it in a plate. And, uh, and so this is, this is evolved in terms of people's thinking about how they actually approach using iPS cells to study disease, to do disease modeling. So the, the primary way that people started off using uh, iPS cells is actually get affected people. So people who have uh, long QT syndrome, many different uh, people have collected them and then actually uh, drop them over here. And then they can actually to see the disease phenotypes and the, and the corrected iPS cells. So, so you can actually, sometimes you can correct each cell. So you can actually have a, at least a control here, six corrected for this one. Maybe that's a potential control. But you know, in for instance, in long QT, we did a study a, a few years ago with that, and uh, my cells were actually in the control group uh, in in this particular setting. And actually, when my cells are made into uh, cardiac myocytes, um, they have a very long uh, 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 interval, uh, and uh, and I and threw the whole study off essentially. Let's see next. Oh, I'm going to see if I can get next. Hmm. I'm a hard time finding my forward button here. Apologize. There we go. Okay. Um, and so, uh, but it turns out that what CRISPR does is actually, instead of having these patient banks, which are really difficult uh, to, uh, you know, completely interpret. I mean, obviously they're valuable. Uh, there's completely valuable, but 
what you really want to do if you want to get to molecular mechanism is you want to have every cell with the exact same genetic background. And what CRISPR does is allow you to actually insert a different mutation to, into, say, each of these lines. And then now we can compare number one to number six. And you can say, does this make a difference? Uh, but one to six in this setting is impossible because the genetic background is different. So uh, having an isogenic series to get at the molecular mechanisms, all these risk factors and stuff like that, uh, it, it, it's still a difficult process to, to, to get some of these uh, subtle phenotypes, but a lot of the subtle phenotypes are more common. And so we want to go after uh, for that and see whether or not we could actually see a difference in a, in a polymorphism, a SNP. And so uh, we did that uh, using this gene called BAG3. BAG3 has mutations that are cause disease. So there's lots of mutations in BAG3 that actually cause a cardiomyopathy. It's actually a haploinsufficient gene, uh, efficiency. And uh, so these, these ones we knew. So somewhere involved in cardiac disease, uh, but what really got, uh, uh, Juan's uh, interest here is that there was a single point mutation here that was very common. About a billion people carry this particular allele, and yet uh, at the same time, uh, and it's protective, but we didn't know what this, this does, and it's just a, 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 a C to an R at this position, uh, and this is really, we just posted this on BioArchive, uh, so uh, the story is uh, publicly available. And so we didn't know how that could happen and how could it be protective? And here's what the effect really was. So if you're a CC, which most people in the room are, I'm a CC as well, uh, is uh, that in, in this particular, at this particular spot, in other words, both mom, mothers and fathers, allele gave me a C, then uh, at this spot, then you're, you're, uh, we'll set that chance of being, say, and this is actually, the chance of cardiomyopathy is really to be on the heart transplant list in this particular study. So if you need a heart, you your very severe heart failure, your chances are essentially, let's just call that average because that's the that's the average group. But if you have a single R in this position, it drops to 50%. And if you're RR, in other words, you're, you've inherited this, this, uh, this allele, you're 80% uh, protected or the chances of you being is, is is one fifth of the of your of the other people uh, there, and this isn't just done once. This is from the original study, but now it has been repeated and repeated and repeated. And uh, the the left ventricular ejection fraction was also different in these patients. So there's something going on in these patients that are different uh, than the other population, and it protects. It seems to protect. Uh, it decreases your chance of being on a heart transplant list. And it also increases the, the muscle mass in some way. Uh, and this was, this was from, the, from the British Heart Study uh, and also from Kaiser, actually two different studies uh, showed the, 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 uh, the left ventricular mass, uh, one by MRI and one by echo. Um, and interestingly, you gotta see where this also is, like how does, where does this allele? So this is the protective allele, the R versus the C. And around 20% of the of of the alleles in the in uh, Europe are are that, and then in in uh, northern India, also about close to 20% are the R there, but nowhere else in the world. So in, in Africa and in in Asia, you don't see it. So there's the, there it's essentially it's it's probably a, a mutation which arose. Uh, during the diaspora from Africa, and then uh, and then probably in contains most of this population here. So you know most of the world. Uh, the news about this is most of the world doesn't have this protective allele, but perhaps a drug which would mimic that protective allele would actually benefit those people who don't have it. Uh, and so that's that's the way we the, the way we think about it is the 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 these folks who have it could potentially tell us about how to treat other people. So is so the question is is this particular allele is it protective? So bag three one fifty one fifty one R is the, the is a protein variant. Uh, does it interact differently with other proteins that are involved in stress essentially? So the the hypothesis here is that the protective allele is somehow getting the heart somehow ready for stress or protecting it from stress so it's able to, 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 to deal with that more. And so it should interact differently. And we can do that, we can test that by uh, mass spectrometry by pulling down and, and uh, seeing who, who they actually bound to. And the other question is, 
is the is the bag three mutants if we make it from the non-protective to the protective allele is it are the cells actually protected in vitro in other words can when we make cardiac myocytes are they protected actually from a stressful situation and the answer to these two things are yes but i'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, about that in uh, briefly so now here's where crispr comes in so we took wild type C, who is not me, actually. Uh, I'm wild type A, and actually my uh, uh, iPS cells are really not great uh, and uh, are not something that you'd give to a high school student uh, or even uh, you just don't give it to anybody. Uh, so because they're, they really spontaneously differentiate, and they have a lot of other problems. But the wild type C is a different uh, uh, a different uh, person and is uh, Asian or uh, uh, background. So. This person obviously does not have the protective allele because he's Asian, uh, and uh, but we can actually engineer the protective allele. So we just make a single base pair change that will now introduce it, right? And we can do it in on one allele, and then we can actually do it. We can make it heterozygous or homozygous. Uh, we have the wild type alleles as well, where we just actually tag the uh, the bag three uh, on all of them. We bag three, and then we also take uh, the disease uh, disease allele. Um, which is um, which we know essentially causes disease. Uh, we actually uh, this is actually in this setting it's the control group, uh, and we actually do when we did uh, APMS, which is affinity purification mass spectrometry. So you what you do is you pull down the the flag tagged uh, bag three and see what sticks to it uh, by mass spec. And uh, I'm not going to talk about this, but the AP the APMS this actually. Uh, for the for the disease one, we actually saw that basically all all the all the proteins that were involved in stress were just gone. So a lot of things just lost its binding. Uh, I'm not going to do that, but it's just sort of a positive control. What we're really kind of interested in it is how do these guys compare to each other because uh, they're genetically identical except for that one base uh, which is uh, which is carried. And so. We do, what, remarkably, we do see changes in the cardiac myocytes in their binding to other, uh, other stress proteins. But interestingly and importantly, we see no changes in the iPS cells that uh, uh, when we compare the protective allele for non-protective allele. In other words, the iPS cells, are, they, they don't, shouldn't have a disease or protection. There's no reason why. BAG3 is actually expressed in the iPS cells. BAG3 is expressed in many parts of the body but the protection was only seen in the heart and we only see the changes in the cardiac cells, not in uh, non-cardiac cells that we examined, okay? Uh, and these, the names of these genes are not important, but it actually is that the, all of the genes, all the genes we see are genes involved in stress. And in other studies, we actually see that the, that the, uh, that the proteins uh, if we just take the cells and push, push them through stress, a lot of them actually cause them to bind uh, these proteins. And these are the ones is the ones that were significantly changed, increased, and then there were some that were decreased. Um, another thing that we saw that I'll indicate before is that we also see a, here you have a heat shock protein, each HSPB7, which is decreased. And that doesn't make sense because you think that this is actually uh, you know, it should be binding more stress proteins. But what's actually happening is there's another heat shock protein, uh, protein uh, uh, B1, which is actually increased. And so what you're having is it's switching the, the, the stress proteins that it's involved in. And, and so that's a particularly interesting uh, uh, observation. Then Finally, the, the uh, and this is the last slide on this uh, on the, on bag three. I think is is that um, that we what we now did is ex take the 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 allelic series and expose them to a stress, which is bortezomib, which is a drug which is known to cause a cardiomyopathy, and these are the percentage of cells that survived or the amount of the the bortezomib that was uh, necessary to kill half the cells. And so uh, this is actually uh, showing that the cells that are carrying the 151, which is the, uh, which is the protective allele, are in fact more protected. So uh, that's, that is complete. So, so we've essentially, um, and, and we have a model uh, for this. I, I think that it's, it's not, uh, I think an important thing here is that you have a mutation here, which is actually causing, this is the protective allele, and our model for it is that some of the heat shock proteins that are coming on are knocking ones that are coming off. So it's changing its repertoire of stress proteins. 
uh, and then actually causing increased binding to a multiple other ones that are, are thought to be. Uh, and so we're actually not following up directly with this in terms of other studies, because they're actually, uh, you know, could be could go lots of different ways. But there's a, a couple of different biotech companies that are actually using these data already, uh, even though we just put it on BioArchive, to actually tune specific drugs that would actually work with it, uh, work with this. And so we'll see if that works. Uh, you know, I wish them luck. And uh, but it's it's going to be. Uh, but it, at least this carries the ball forward uh, a bit. Uh, so, you know, so does this, uh, this variant, does this actually uh, interact differently with myocytes? And the answer is yes. Uh, and then is uh, the, are these cardiac myocytes uh, protected in stress? Yes. And so taken together, at least it shows, uh, it gives us at least an idea that this works. And, and once again, I just want to say this would be impossible to do just collecting cells from people who have different uh, alleles, uh, you'd have to have hundreds of alleles. It would cost, uh, uh, it, it cost, you know, it would cost a thousand times more and you might not even work. Right. Uh, but because the genetic background is a lot of other differences. And, but here we were able to actually get that. So I want to talk about, uh, switch gears here and, uh, to talk about, uh, repairing disease. And, uh, here I just have a short story about, uh, and really we, Initially, we didn't even think that we could use CRISPR for repairing disease, but now we're really uh, actually, uh, uh, that's actually what the whole lab is focused on now. And um, you know, skip this, repairing obviously has very different uh, requirements than decoding uh, and sort of area of unknown is really not wanted. You need to know exactly the gene that you're going to, uh, to, to work with. Um, so, of the three different kinds of edits that you can do, the reconstruction is the most attractive, but is most difficult, specifically in non-dividing cells like cardiac myocytes, like neurons, where really a large proportion of diseases, this is really difficult. And that's a shame, and I'll get back to that because there's new ways of doing it, but currently difficult. The insertions of genes are also somewhat difficult, in, especially in non-dividing cells. You can do it, uh, in, in, in tissue culture, but it's very difficult in a person. The only thing that we think that can actually be approached, at least given the sort of the current technology, is excision. So in other words, it's really good at doing a cut and then getting rid of, say, one base or adding one base. That kind of small change, uh, that is actually uh, very efficient and can be done in, in non-dividing cells like myocytes, like neurons. And so the story, this, this brief story I'm going to uh, outline is just how we've actually focused on a, a particular disease of, of dominant negative uh, of uh, axonal disease uh, mutations. Uh, that there's, there's a number of reasons why we, we uh, chose this. Uh, the example I'll give you is NEFL, but we're working on like four or five other, other genes as well. And the basic idea is we take patient iPS cells, we make the disease neurons, uh, and they make really nice uh, axonal neurons. And that's uh, one of the advantages of this. We can do CRISPR editing. We can see the healthy neurons. And, uh, and this was done by a, a terrific our, uh, research associate, Carissa. So the, one of the reasons we did, we did this in, in, uh, in, in the motor neurons in particular is the genetics are just spectacular uh, in, that, in this system. And so the NEFL causes CMT is a crippling neuropathy. And the way it causes disease is you have a point mutation, say in red here with a wild type. And you, know, you could say, oh, that's not so bad, just 50% of the genes. And then what, it must be worse if it was the other, include the other one. But in fact, this actually is maximally bad uh, just with one point mutation. And the reason is because this makes a, a large complex of proteins called a filament, a neurofilament. And uh, so even though you, it's only 50%, all the filaments are going to be poisoned uh, by, this, uh, by this mutation. There's gonna be no mass, uh, large filaments which are gonna be free of disease. And this looks like a disaster, right? I mean, how are we gonna actually approach this? But in fact, uh, it's, uh, in, in fact, it's a real opportunity. And that opportunity is there because if you can actually delete this, you go from super diseased to 100% cured. And uh, that's because if you only have one of the wild type here, you can actually, all the filaments and stuff like that have to be made with the normal version. And you can say, oh, but that's, Bruce, that's not going to work because 
uh, because you know you you've got two copies and you should have you know now you only have one copy that could cause disease in itself. Well, it actually that's what's called haploinsufficiency, uh, and this is actually haplosufficient. So in other words, human genetics actually tells us that a people that have only one wild type copy have absolutely normal physiology, normal neurophysiology in particular. And uh, so we already, so this experiment has already been done. There are people who are already lacking one, uh, or only have one copy. And, uh, and all we're doing is trying to induce this sort of after, after the fact uh, and induce this condition uh, with CRISPR. And the, um, and so anyhow, so that's that's it. And so there's because the genetics are so good, people have been able to identify them. And because also people who are homozygous uh, loss of function are still viable, that's that's another reason why we can identify these people. So one of the reasons we make motor neurons is they're really easy to make now. There's certain tricks that we can do, molecular biology tricks to uh, essentially, and that this is actually so in a week we can have a plate full of motor neurons uh, like this. And this is a time-lapse video of motor of, of IPS cells that were once IPS cells that during the 16 hour period are now stretching out their, uh, their uh, axons here. And you can just see the long processes uh, and that they're reaching out beyond the, the, the field. And so having this in a homogeneous pattern, having it happen in 96 well plates and reproducibly uh, makes it an ideal system actually for, uh, you know, essentially uh, progressing. And what happened then is that when we take NEFL, these are from a patient who has the disease, the NEFL is the protein, and we look for where the protein is, it's all just piled up here uh, in the cytoplasm next to the nucleus. The nucleus here is in blue. Uh, you can see the nucleus in blue, and you can actually see right around the nucleus is these gigantic, uh, you know, inclusions of protein that is what causes the disease. But if you do what, they, what we call frame shift, which is essentially a excision, but just of one, a single base. Uh, so there's only one base difference between this and this, uh, and one base on one allele, uh, and they, uh, it actually causes a complete uh, resolution. So this is actually what the wild type uh, motor neurons look like. And just to show you uh, that, I'm going to compare it to all the different ones. So we have wild type. These are the two pictures I showed you before. And then here's uh, a, a, a one, and you can see wild type looks just like that. And then we also even changed uh, the, 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 the original mutation and just corrected it so that it's completely wild type. So they've got two good alleles and that actually looks uh, really identical to each other. And when we actually have an automated image analysis here, we actually see that the, um, you can see the autom in, in automated image analysis that here's the score for wild type frame shifted and uh, corrected. And they're essentially the same, but when we actually, this is the disease allele uh, that we can take down with a single base pair change uh, down to there. The specificity I should add is also uh, very high with this uh, so that we're, uh, it's, it's essentially 99% of the, uh, the cuts are in the, disease allele rather than the, the other one. Let's see, 42, good, all right. Um, so we're, we're now moving towards, uh, you know, a discussion with people for large animal models and uh, small and large animal models for, for this and for, for multiple other ones. So what are the concerns? Uh, I'm gonna just uh, let, touch on this lightly. I think that the, uh, in 2018, there was a germline uh, gene editing, uh, and uh, just to say, just see, tell you essentially how this was done. Jun uh, uh, Q, uh, he is is actually the uh, or JK as we uh, call him is uh, was actually uh, got his PhD in the, in the U.S. Uh, and then we had to start a lab in, in China, and uh, and then in November of 2018 uh, announced that he had made two babies. Uh, Lulu and Nana, and this was this. He was editing the CCR5 gene, which really has no benefit to Lulu and Nana, but also uh, is is known that you can get rid of the CCR5 uh, uh, allele already because there are people who don't have it. But it would never have been approved by a human subjects committee because there's no benefit to the patient. The patient being uh, the kids at this point, because really uh, there's there's other ways of preventing HIV than that. 
Now, how did they do that? Uh, they took a donor oocyte. Uh, they did, an, and during uh, ICSI is actually is intracytoplasmic sperm injection uh, performed by millions of times actually uh, for in vitro fertilization. They just take a sperm and directly inject it into the egg and then have the egg uh, go into here. So this is, this is the background material. This goes on in vitro fertilization clinics all over. And what they did is essentially recreated in vitro fertilization clinic but added one little step, uh, Dr. He added uh, the, the Cas9 uh, with the sperm, essentially. Uh, so, uh, went, and the CRISPR was targeting the, the uh, CCR5 and then returned it to the womb. Now he, you know, he, he did this with, essentially without any approval. Uh, and uh, the, and uh, just to be uh, interesting, I, this, this is actually the, the cost of his experiment, the added, added cost of the experiment was really quite small. So in other words, that Cas9, uh, and the guide, uh, which are the two things uh, needed, I thought that we we thought that that you know just just using their protocols, uh, not using but co uh, but uh, <laughs> copying uh, the information from the protocols and, and looking up on uh, where they bought it, that that was the cost. So this is the the burden the the burden to actually uh, do this is actually very uh, small. Um, so he's. The, the, the bottom line is that he got in a lot of trouble. He's in prison. Uh, he's got uh, $400,000 of fines. We haven't heard that much from him, but uh, I think that it'll be interesting to see what happens further. Institutional response is uh, really that there's, uh, that there's actually, um, you know, outrage in terms of to actually do this uh, without approval, but uh, following uh, regular CHR protocol and so on, uh, that uh, multiple places, including Columbia, Columbia and Harvard, have programs in place. Uh, and there, there is a regulatory path towards this, uh, and I don't have time for a full discussion of it, but it is something that we, uh, that we follow closely. Uh, and there's, there's a big community response, but at the same time, there's really nothing that actually can stop this in the future from it happening in other countries, because there's really no governing board that actually will uh, say, for instance, uh, uh, govern in the U.S. that's going to have a sway over what happens, say, in, in, in Russia or somewhere like that. And so what are the other promises? And I wanted to end on other promises here. Uh, and we've got, okay, got about five minutes left. So, uh, or 10 minutes left. Um, so let me just say what the, uh, how else can excision, remember we talked about excision before, I gave one example uh, there's actually a number of cardiac related ones. A PCSK9 is a natural, uh, a knockout of PCSK9 lowers LDL in adults. The CRISPR knockout in the liver uh, is in the liver for, uh, by Verve is look, had 90%, 80% uh, reduction uh, in, in PCSK9. Really remarkable to just knock it out in only uh, the, uh, the liver and have that high an effect. Um, you know, I, I think that there's obviously monoclonal antibodies that will take out PCSK9. There might be small molecule drugs, uh, but there are some people who are certainly pushing uh, this as just a one-time uh, therapy uh, and uh, cheaper and whatever. So, so that that's something that people are are talking about. We're not doing it, but just putting it out there. Fetal hemoglobin um, is is potentially curative to anybody who's got sickle cell anemia or thalassemias. Uh, because the fetal hemoglobin doesn't have the mutations and you can upregulate them, uh, the fetal hemoglobin, uh, then and enhancer deletions are really, that's actually the leading, uh, the, the leading re uh, reason why people will actually use uh, the uh, uh, CRISPR in, in, uh, in therapeutic trials is really uh, for this. So the, it's, there's multiple ways, shot, shots on goal for CRISPR uh, and uh, or other types of things for, for uh sickle cell anemia and for thalassemia, but this one is probably the best one actually. And I bet you that upregulating fetal hemoglobin with CRISPR probably be the lead uh, target. Muscular dystrophy, it's a, a bit, uh, still there is a huge gene and you could actually skip over mutations. It's so big, you can get rid of little pieces of it in the middle that cause problems. And uh, and you can and it's worked in dogs uh, dog model uh, quite well, uh, but there's some uh, technical uh, barriers. Insertion is a, what I talked about before. Uh, is you, they have this can be done, but it's probably at this point best uh, with 
either AAV or lentivirus, some kind of viral delivery, uh, CRISPR-free, essentially, the, the standard viral vectors that will, uh, will cause overexpression of something will take care of most things if you're missing a gene. Uh, but, uh, there's, but there's still strategies to use CRISPR, but I'm not going to go into that. Uh, and then reconstruction is where the most work has been done uh, and where you're changing space editing in particular is important. Right now, using current techniques, we can actually change anything to anything uh, in a dividing cell. So hematopoietic stem cells in particular, other cell types that are caused to divide, you can actually put large insertions, uh, single base changes, lots of different things can happen. And that's a, a lot of what the um, what you know Alex Marston and a bunch of people are doing with, with uh, hematopoietic stem cells and to deliver genes uh, that were, uh, you know, that were say missing in people who have uh, skid and things like that. But, um, but it's super difficult to do this in non-dividing cells. And that's because essentially during the cell division is when a lot of the recombination happens uh, that sort of tricks, uh, you know, the cells to incorporate uh, some of the, the things that we want to incorporate. But in a non-dividing cell, it doesn't have the machinery to deal with um, the, the cell division. And uh, so it has very different DNA repair machinery because it doesn't have to deal with uh, dividing chromosomes and things like that. And so initially I thought that this would be impossible, but recently there's this new technology called base editing, which is, is still, uh, still in its early days, but essentially will go without cutting it will actually go and modify the surface of the DNA uh, in such a way that will allow it to then be changed to a different uh, nucleotide. Uh, it's, uh, sorry, it doesn't fully cut, it just nicks. And let me just show you what that is about. So this is traditional sort of way of making, uh, inserting genes is you make a double cut. I'm showing CRISPR here with two, two cuts here. And so, because it actually, it does have two cut sites as I showed in that original cartoon, and it was that it makes a full cut. There's an emergency response in the cell to actually repair that. And during that time, you can actually provide a template that say has this green in it. This green will then get incorporated and then you can get a therapeutic change. So that's that works great in, in, in dividing cells. But in, uh, in base editing, you can do something else, which is essentially you can make a CRISPR where now it's this double, it, this one is inactivated. So we now only have one cut site. It can only cut on the top and you, you get a, a reaction, but there's no, the DNA is essentially still, uh, uh, still holding together. So it's not as much of a response. And when you get that, you can also essentially uh, modify uh, this, this thing. So it's not quite uh, the, the right thing yet, but during the repair process of this, of this NIC, it would, can turn it into the base that you want. Now, um, there's only, you know, there's basically, uh, a, there's only a couple of, of changes and one of them is to adenine uh, to, uh, uh, and, and that, that can be changed, but this is promising technology. A lot of people think that it's going to work. And the key thing is that this actually works in, in non-dividing cells. So like, and, and that's that at, at least at this point, we haven't really, you know, we haven't published that yet, but other people have actually seen that. We're seeing it, that it's not, uh, that it's working on uh, non-dividing cells. And so we think that this is extremely promising uh, for, for making uh, uh, modifications. Um, so major challenges in, uh, ahead, I'm going to end in a, in a minute or so here, uh, is that uh, disease modeling uh, reveals uh, disease me mechanisms as, as well as new treatments. And so in a way with precision that we couldn't have before, rare and curable diseases, I think, are going to take the lead in terms of testing new uh, uh, CRISPR delivery methods. But there's clearly that as it gets to be shown if it gets to be shown that I think all the signs are that uh, in, used correctly, it can be used safely, that then applications for more common diseases like the PCSK9, like some of the other ones are possible uh, in the future. And obviously there's, there's ethical concerns about the misuse of continue, uh, will continue. And, and we're really, we're not gonna get, I mean, the only thing that surprises me actually is that we haven't had more of that, uh, 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 you know, in the last, in last couple of years. It seems like it's died down, but 
um, you know, 10 years from now, we're, we're going to be, uh, this is, this is going to be an issue all with us for, for a while. Um, so with that, I think I'm going to, uh, stop and, um, I, I don't know, I could go into, uh, whatever mode it is, uh, I can stop share and then. Thank you. There you go. And if that anyone has talk. any questions, I really enjoy, uh, questions. Yeah. Um, I had a quick question. I was wondering if you saw a role for CRISPR or these induced pluripotent stem cells in specific physiologies and what came to mind when you talked about insertions and excisions or creating cells um, were our hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients um, where they have an excess of cardiomyocytes or even our physiologies where we have left ventricular thinning such as um, ischemic heart disease. Yeah. So. Uh... I think that the uh, it's a very interesting question. The uh, I think we we're collecting a number of genes which cause cardiomyopathy, can cause cardiomyopathy in rare instances, uh, and uh, so troponin, the myosins, um, and the theory has been for some of them is that the for instance with some of the myosin mutations is that they are uh, functional changes. In other words, some make the head go faster and some go slower. Uh, and that, that's the difference between hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and, and dilated cardiomyopathy. Now, an alternative approach, I mean, that, and that's possible. And if that were the case, uh, then the only approach to that kind of disease would be a repair. So you could just you, you'd change the mutation back to what it was. But an alternative hypothesis, which I think is at this point, uh, you know, and this is not specific on one gene, but for all of them actually, is that, that some of them are dominant negatives and some of them are dominant negatives and haplosufficient potentially. Um, and uh, the problem, and I think there's some evidence in mice, for instance, that you can actually get rid of one allele of myosin, heavy chain, myosin six, or oh, there, there's a couple of them where you get rid of one and the mice are normal if they're heterozygous. And so if that were the case for people, and then we would have a dominant negative mutation and haplosufficient, then really the, the goal would not be actually to repair the mutation, but actually just to get rid of the mutant allele. And I actually think that this will work on five or six genes uh, that cause uh, cardiomyopathy, but we don't have the genetic data for that. So in other words, to really show that it's haplosufficient, in other words, one allele is gone, you need the patients that only have one allele and be able to do a cardiac MRI and a full physical to say, this patient is completely normal, but doesn't have uh, but only has one copy of the gene, then actually it would be completely uh, reasonable to actually go after that disease by deleting the disease allele. And it doesn't matter if it's hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or dilated cardiomyopathy, it would cure the disease, right? Uh, but we don't have the genetic data that I know of, at least uh, to, 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 uh, you know, to, to warrant such, a, such an endeavor at this moment. Although there's, there's some evidence and, you know, some evidence for what I'm saying. Thank you. I have a question from Dr. Moslehi. I'll let him ask it live. Hi, Bruce. Uh, great talk. Really clear and uh, a really great talk. I have, I have two questions that are so, sort of un interrelated. Does the protective effects that you see with the BAC3, the, the C1, was it 5.1R mutation, does this protective effect confer in your APS model hold true with other forms of injury? such as ischemia and, or doxorubicin. I, I partly ask that because vortism is not usually a common toxicity model we use. And sort of related to that question, when you look at human populations with the mutation, are there specific types of cardiomyopathy where the protection is specific, more uh, seen versus others? Uh, sorry, uh, what was that, the last question again? So the qu sec so, sort of related to the first question, are, when you look at populations with the C151R uh -huh. mutation, uh -huh. Uh -huh. are there types of cardiomyopathy where the protection is specifically seen? 
Is it more ischemic versus peripartum versus chemotherapy versus? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So, so all the data, and it's all, sort of related to the first question, I guess. Yeah. So all the all the data is GWAS data. So we don't really have. There are not that much in terms of. I mean, there's some MRI of some of the patients and stuff like that uh, from the uh, the UK Biobank data, uh, but the all the studies were doing dilated cardiomyopathy, not hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Okay. So all all this, in other words, all the protection was seen for dilated cardiomyopathy and actually not for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And that's consistent with the, I mean, not consistent. I mean, it, it's, it, it's it, uh, in the setting of the fact that BAG3 also causes a dilated cardiomyopathy, that's consistent. And the reason we took to, chose bartizumab is because we'd use bartizumab, you know, uh, because of its, its role along the same pathway as, as BAG3, uh, you know, that works on in terms of the protein uh, quality control. But um, you know now these cells uh, certainly could be tested under different uh, situations, and that would be a, a really interesting thing to see whether or not with the cells that you can tell if it was more protective or not uh, for particular types of things. I I don't uh, at this point though I don't know if the assay is is robust for a large screen. It's really complicated to do those. That last figure where the different protection was 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 very time consuming. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's not like the, it's not the kind of thing that we could screen on. We're hoping to get an assay that really you could screen thousands of drugs for, but we, we don't, we haven't done that yet. Haven't ha figured that out. Thank you. I think we had a question by Dr. Choi, but I think he might've logged off. Um, but anyways, thank you everyone for joining us and uh, we'll see you guys next week for our next cardiology grand round. Okay, great. All right. Thank you very much.